Um, I may stop this presentation at some point too, uh, because I feel like what I'm going to be showing you on my screen might be more important on this skeleton, actually, than even what's on the presentation. So uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about the abdominals. I feel like um, one of my big philosophies on being a better massage therapist than other massage therapists, which is what I want for you guys, is to be able to work well all the stuff that other people can't work well. Like everybody rubs a back. Everybody does a pretty decent job on a back. But once they leave the back and they get to the legs and the arms and the feet and the hands and the stomach and the neck, if they even work on that stuff well, they tend to not be as good at that stuff. And so I, I get really excited when we learn about the less common things and learn how to be really good therapists at the other stuff. Because I'd love you to have this massage where people are like, oh man, that back work is amazing. And then it keeps on being amazing as you go to other parts of the body. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So I'm also excited to talk to you about the abdominals because they have everything to do with the structural anatomy of your body and why I can stand upright. So I do have a spine that supports me, but I've said this many times. In my thoracic region, the spine is supported in front by the sternum. The ribs actually wrap around the thoracic vertebrae and come in front and make a sternum, which acts as another support for the spine. So you see people move their thoracic region back and forth, but you don't see the actual thoracic region bend very much because it's supported by this rib. So what you really see is the thoracic region going forward and back at the lumbar area. That's where all the wiggle happens. And it's a really big problem that nature has to solve in, in your body. It has to make you rigid enough that you can pick stuff up and you can move around. And it also has to make you flexible enough that you can bend over and you can be soft when you need to be and you can take impact and all these things. And your abdominal region is part of the solution to that. So what your body said was, gosh, we've got this. I mean, I don't really know if this is what your body said or what God said, but this is what I imagine God said when he was making you. Um, that you've got this lumbar region down here that really has very little support. And you've got powerful spinal erectors in the back. The erector spinae group. Remember those? Those are in the back. We kind of see a picture of them in this picture right now. In fact, this is a good picture of the erector spinae muscles and... What other, what other muscles can you see in this picture? Anybody? They're cute. Uh, is it the Lucas Uh No. But I feel like I see little shoelace -y things there, too. The multifidi rotator? rotator? Yeah, I think so. Rotatories and multifidi. I think are what I'm seeing there too, along with, by the way, the iliocostalis and longissimus, and so, and spinalis probably, those three too, yeah. So, those are really powerful muscles. Think of what we have lacing up the back side of the body. The back side of the body, we've got multifidi and rotatories lacing it up. We've got the spinalis on both sides, right, Miss Hunter? We've got the longissimus on both sides, and we've got the iliocostalis on both sides, and all these muscles, their main action. What's the main action of all the muscles I just named right now? If they're working bilaterally, what's the main action of them? Um, extension? Yes, extension. And Miss Nguyen, I saw you do the extension. Thank you. I saw Miss Nguyen do this. Yes, exactly. So these muscles pull me back. So in general, and I'm oversimplifying, but in general, my abdominal's job is to pull me forward. And that pulling forward, but this pulling back is what gives stability to my low back. Without that, I'm really wobbly. It's why anytime you have back problems, they're actually like work on your core strength, which is usually basically your abs. It's also your um, iliopsoas, but we'll get to that. But, but so this front pulling is actually very good for your low back to stabilize it. So the idea is that I pull here and I pull here and all of a sudden I'm pretty stable. Just like you would a large tower, right? You pull, you have wires on a large tower that come off that tower and that's what stabilizes it. Yeah? And 
things in your body need to be balanced. So if your back muscles are really strong, but your abs are really weak, it creates imbalance problems. It creates structural problems. And it can even create pelvic tilt problems. And pelvic tilt problems are bad because your pelvis is what your spine stacks on. And if your pelvis is not aligned, your spine can't possibly be aligned. Do you need this room, Vince? Oh, okay. I just saw you stand there. Do you need me? Yep. Hold on, everybody. Sorry. One second. Yes, sir. I'm muted. I'm sorry. Don't be. All right. They're talking about moving and they're making mistakes, <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> so they moved all the furniture in one room. And they're like, oh, that's the wrong room. We need to I'll redo the floor in that room. And they're moving it all back over here, too. Um, and yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's not like we're building bombs. Anyway, so um, where was I? I was saying how amazing the abs are and, and the fact that they need to be strong. And I was talking about the pelvic tilt and stuff. And do you have a question, Ms. Petrie? I thought you raised your hand. Yeah. Uh you said that the abdominals are weak, and I didn't understand what you meant by that. Oh, I'm sorry. I said if they are weak. If they are weak, it causes a problem because you need them kind of as strong as your back to kind of help with this thing. If they are weak. And the problem is in our society, people's backs are usually pretty strong. They might be bothering them, but they're pretty strong because we're hunched over stuff and we're using our back and stuff. But often our abdominals aren't as strong, just our lifestyle. Um, allows for that. But no, abdominals weren't born weak or they aren't weak in general. No, they're actually really strong too. Yeah, very powerful. Um, very powerful and very much like your back muscles, they don't tire very quickly. So they're, they're very impressive. Thank you for asking. Okay, so later we'll learn about pelvic tilt, but just remember if you're building a tower on top of something that tilts, that tower is going to be messed up. That's why the pelvis is so important. By the pelvis, I mean the sacrum and the spine that sits on it. That sacrum is part of your hips. And so if your hips move, your spine has to move. And that's a problem. Yeah? So we look a lot at how people's pelvises tilt. Forward or back or left or right. Um, because it can, it can mess up their spine. All right. But today we're just going to talk about the strength of the spine by balancing out the spinal erectors with the abdominals. Yes. Yes. Um, Miss Hunter. Miss Hunter, I'm calling on you because I think you know this answer and I saw it in your homework and I was really impressed. Um, can you hear me? Miss Hunter, don't let me down. They might have just moved her. Miss Hunter? No. Okay. Who can tell me how many abdominal muscles you have? Five is correct. Yes, five is correct. You wouldn't necessarily even know this from the book. Sometimes they places print it differently. Can anybody name the five abdominal muscles? Not without looking at the book. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I think I can. Well, Miss Monreal, please, please show us. I thought you were watching okay. Little Bo Peep. Anyway. Well, hold on. I didn't walk in. <laughs> oh, you're gonna be brilliant um, really quick abdominus, in the book. Rectus abdominus. Rectus abdominus. External oblique, internal oblique, quadratus laborum, and transverse abdominus. Yes. All done, sir. Some of them made a popping sound as if they're not too tight. As long as you got them. Yeah, they, they made a pop. I'll look at them. Cool, thank you. That was perfect, ma'am. Perfect. All right, everybody, do this with me. Can you? I want to make sure you can see me. Okay. Say rectus abdominis. <laughs> and stroke up and down your belly like an idiot. Rectus abdominis. This will help us later. You'll see why. Take your hands now, like you're putting them in angled outside pockets, and say external obliques. External obliques. Now cross them over, like you're reaching for guns, like a gunslinger or something. Cross them over and say internal obliques. I'll explain why this is so important later. Now say transverse abdominis. Now put your hands in your back. Right here, in your low back, and say quadratus lumborum. 
Cool. Your quadratus lumborum, by the way, is about the size of your hands in back. Um, but I'm going to show you why we did the, the silly side pocket thing in a second. It really, really helps later with um, actions and recognizing stuff. And abdominals, by the way, just to warn all of you that have been so frustrated with rotation stuff, some of your abdominals help you rotate. And some help you rotate to the same side they contract on, and some help you rotate to the opposite side they contract on. And today with the abdominals, we're going to solve it. And I'm even going to give you a tiny little insight that at the end of the year, I know for a fact in the cumulative test on muscles, there is a question about the rotation the abdominals create. I know it. It's one of the harder questions on the test. And so I'm giving you a preview of how to answer that question. Yeah? So pay attention. That's, that's my whole little speech there. Okay, let's look at the abdominals really quickly. Do, 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 do. Okay, this one's easy. Um, your deepest abdominal muscle, your deepest abdominal muscle is the quadratus lumborum. It is so deep, but people don't even think about it as an abdominal muscle because it's so deep it's on your back. We call it deep, meaning it's deep through the front of your body. So if you can see the skeleton here, it's so deep that it's on the back side of the body. So, if I were to tape it off, by the way, it goes from the posterior crest of the ilium, which just is the back of your hip, posterior crest of your ilium, um, to the transverse processes of like L1 through L4, and the last rib. And so it looks a lot like this. important things to know about it. Some books, when you read them, you don't, they don't even mention the quadratus lumborum because they lump it into a back muscle. It is a back muscle. You've all rubbed across it <laughs> already. But it's, it's a back muscle only in the sense that it's on the back. It's an abdominal muscle. It's part of the abdominal group. It's part of what makes the center soft part of your body, the part that can bend, strong. So, look at the angles it runs. What are its actions going to be? Anybody? Lateral flexion. Lateral flexion of the spine and lateral and tilt of the hip. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what? Well, no, I don't think... Okay, so let me explain this to you guys too. If I laterally flex, that's really the same as tilting my spot, my hip too. When they mean when they mean pelvic tilt, they mean your hip coming up. Well, flexing and tilting are kind of the same thing. My pelvis and my back are getting close to each other. Does that make sense? So if I can flex down here, I can tilt up here. Tilting is the same thing. To my body, it's the same thing happening here. I'm tilting over and my hip's coming up. Yep. Uh, pelvic tilt. So if one side of this was tight, if one side of your quadratus lumborum was tight, you'd have a hip up like this. And what would happen to your spine if you had a hip up like this? If my sacrum is normally like this, 
and my spine is built on top of it, and all of a sudden I have a tilted hip, my sacrum is like this, this is a huge exaggeration obviously, right? I have my mic on whenever you want me to answer. <laughs> okay, so cute. Thank you, Ms. Montreal. If I have my spine like this, my spine's, I'm, I'm not gonna go walking around like this. My body will correct it. But how will it correct it? It will make up for the imbalance and it will, that's where you get your curvature of the spine in scoliosis. Bam! Oh my God, I didn't know she was gonna say scoliosis. Yes, so my spine that's supposed to be straight will now have to curve a little bit. Now, by the way, don't get confused about curves of the spine. My spine has a curve in it right now. It's supposed to have a curve, right? It curves in at my neck, curves out at my back. We're not talking about curves like those down my backside. We're talking about curves right here. There's not supposed to be any curve. We're talking about curves here. That's scoliosis. And we're saying this tilt of the, the pelvis would create a forced scoliosis. Now, this is not the cause of all scoliosis at all. But my point is if my hip is off, my body is always trying to get my head back over my center of gravity. I can't go walking around like this. I'd fall over. So if I have a hip up like this, my body will get my head back. And look what it did already to do that. I mean, this is, a, this is me naturally doing this. Otherwise, I start to fall. So my body goes up. We're going to curve. So it curved my spine back in to make up for this hip problem. And I'm exaggerating all this, but that's from a tight quadratus lumborum on one side. Because what it does is... Tilt the hip up or flex the spine over or both. It's really the same thing when it's working unilaterally. The reason it's often called a back muscle, even though it's not, is because it's in your back. And when it works bilaterally, what does it do? What happens when both sides pull bilaterally? What happens? What, Miss Petrie? What was the question? What happens when both sides contract bilaterally? Oh, it makes you extend. Yes, 100% it makes you extend. Thank you. Right. So it is one of the muscles that works along with your spinal erectors, your erector spinae group, and your multifidae multi multi and, and rotatores. Um, it is one of those muscles that works with that which is why it gets lumped in the back muscles, even though it's an abdominal muscle. So when it works bilaterally, it's another one of your heavy extenders. So this muscle works a lot. But that's not its main job. Its main job, believe it or not, is pelvic tilt. Why would I have this beautiful muscle back there to tilt my pelvis? This muscle, I don't think it says this in your book, um, but it's something good to know. What is it? This muscle is known as your hip hiker, as in it hikes up your hip. Why would I want to hike up my hip? Because believe it or not, every time I walk, I have to lift up this side of my hip to make sure that my leg doesn't drag on the ground. You guys wiggle your hips every time you walk. Now, sometimes models walking down the runway exaggerate it more. Boom, 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 right? But but what they're exaggerating is a normal human walk. Even guys <laughs> hike their hip up a little Get bit. In top <laughs> Even guys hike their hip up a little bit to, to get their leg. When your leg swings under and you're walking, you lift your hip up a little bit to make sure that it swings through. And you also do it just so you don't fall over. So believe it or not, when I lift my right leg up, my left side contracts so I don't fall over. When I lift my left leg up, my right side contracts so I don't fall over. Right? Because when I lift up my when I lift up my left leg, I want to fall this way. So my hip hiker, my quadratus lumborum pulls me back. It causes me to try to flex to my other side so I can take that step. So this is a hip hiker muscle. It's a muscle that helps you walk and hike. You use it all the time. All the time. And so if somebody ever asks you what the main function of this muscle is, it's to tilt the pelvis. It's to hike the hips. That's the main function of this muscle. It's to help you walk. It does a lot of stuff. It is also highly palpatable and highly massageable. And let me tell you how. If I simply hook my hand on somebody's stomach here, 
from, from behind when they're face down, when they're prone, and run my hand across like this, it'll catch on that muscle. It'll actually catch on the side of it. And then I can pull on it and actually stretch it. It's actually a very easy muscle to, to grab. And I'll start to, to pull on that too. Very, very effective. Very effective for low back problems. Very effective for all sorts of stuff. So, quadratus lumborum attaches the posterior crest of the ilium, the back side of the hips, to the transverse processes of L1 through L4, probably go to L5, but L5 is down too low to grab onto anything, and the last rib, which would be rib 12, which is your last rib. And the nickname for this muscle is the hip hiker. It's a very old school nickname, but it's still valid. Cool? Awesome. Okay. So, uh, Miss Hunter, what is the name of the deepest abdominal muscle? Quadratus lumborum. Thank you. Let me explain to you how it got its name, everybody. So, what does quad mean? Four. Thank you. Quad means four. And when you see quadriceps, it means four heads. Seps is heads. But quadratus means four-sided. Like quadrilateral. So, if you look at it in the book, not my tape off, it looks kind of like... It looks kind of like a rectangle. And I'm making a big deal out of this because you'll, you'll, we'll learn about other quadratus muscles and they all tend to kind of look like a, tri uh, a rectangle or a squished over square or something like that. So this means the four-sided muscle found in your lumbar region, quadratus lumborum. The four-sided muscle found in your lumbar region. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Torres, what's the deepest abdominal muscle? Um, quadrate, quadrate, I don't know how to say it. Well, kind of quadratus? think of it, in, yeah, quadratus, think of it in Spanish, quadratus. And what's the second part? <laughs> Quadratus lumborum. 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 Yeah. Think of Harry Potter. Quadratus lumborum. I just turned you into an abdominal muscle. Yes. Thank you. Miss Cooper, what's the nickname for this muscle? What's the nickname for the quadratus lumborum? Yo, I missed that. <laughs> Yo, you sure did. I was laying down some knowledge on you, and you missed it. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm making this little chart thing. And... I know. I'm just teasing you. It's the hip hiker because it hikes hip up your hiker. hips. Hikes up your hips when you walk. Yeah. Hip hiker. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Miss Petrie, what's the main... Why do we have this muscle? What's its main function? Tilts them, tilts them, tilts the hips, tilt. Oh, tilts. Yeah, okay. sorry, I think the sound is not helping you. It tilts the hips, yes. And it tilts the hips, and Miss Stanley, why does it tilt the hips? How does that help me? Why would I want to tilt my hips from side to side? Uh, to walk comfortably? Yes, to help you walk, to help you walk. Cool. Yeah. And 
Miss Harper, what does quadratus lumborum mean? Could not have said that better myself, thank you. Quadratus means four-sided, lumborum means lumbar region. It's the four-sided muscle found in the lumbar region. That was fantastic, thank you. Miss Nguyen, what is the deepest abdominal muscle? Uh, yeah, no, you're good. Qua? Qua? Dre? Dre? Tus? Quadre? Tus? Quadratus? Quadratus. Beautiful. Lum? Lum? Borum? Borum. Lumborum? Lum? Borum. Beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you. Seriously. Uh, Miss Hansen? Um, what is the action of this muscle, quadratus lumborum, if it acts bilaterally, both sides? To tilt, uh, bilaterally, um, it, it, oh, it, it the last rent. is that right? It extends the, extends the back, just extension. Extends the back. Okay. Extends the back. Think about the ponytails again and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm pulling up both sides of my shirt. If I'm pulling up both sides of my shirt back here, I'm going to go back. Cool? Yes. Cool. Uh, Ms. Giannis, if this muscle works unilaterally, what does it do? Um, it tilts the pelvis. I'm so sorry, what? It tilts the pelvis. You said it, unilaterally, right? Yes. It does. It tilts the pelvis or flexes the spine. And basically, they're the same thing, right? My spine coming to my pelvis is the same thing as my pelvis coming to my spine. I hope you guys see that. Good. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Hey, Miss Cooper, what's the nickname for the quadratus lumborum? The hip hiker? Yeah. Um, and why is it helpful? What's, what's good about this muscle? What does it help you do? I help you walk. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it helps you do a lot of things, but that's the answer I wanted. You're absolutely right. Um, Ms. Felix Osuna, why is this called the quadratus lumborum? What does quadratus lumborum actually mean? It means four-sided lumborum because it's in the lumbar region. Yes, in the lumbar region. Thank you. Four-sided muscle lumbar region. Very cool. Uh, Ms. Belotic, if this muscle works bilaterally, what movement does it create? Um, Bilaterally, both sides. It helps with inhaling and exhaling. That's what it, on the slideshow it says that. Really? Yeah, it says fix the last rib during forced inhalation. Oh, an exhalation. That's. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, well. Yeah, but, but think about it. By the way, I mean, you, you, I'm sorry, by the way. I was not acting like that. I was trying to interpret what you said and think about how I felt about it. I disagree with the book a little bit. Um, it mm -hmm. does, by the way, I'm sure it helps with forced exhalation. We'll talk about that later. But, but still, what happens if both sides of a muscle pull on my back back here? What happens if you grab onto both sides of my shirt back here and pull them? Extension. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, by the and I no no don't be sorry. You read the book and that's what it said and like you know that's what we asked you to do. We gave you the book and stuff like that. But yeah, you know anyway, good job, uh, Mr. Kandaris. Question. Yeah, what's your question? Because in the book in the slideshow it says that unilaterally it helps to extend. So is it just don't put that as unilaterally and that's only bilaterally or? Yeah, yeah, Miss Jonas. So that's why I was pausing when Ms. Belotic said that, because then I finally read the slide, which I haven't read. Um, and I was like, well, I don't know if, I, I didn't even think about the forced exhalation and inhalation, although I'm aware of it, but I was like, and then I all of a sudden noticed that it had extend under unilaterally. Well, that 
doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, just from like, like yes, in this case, I 100% disagree with the book that unilaterally it extends. <laughs> because, because if I grab onto this part of my shirt and I start doing that, I tend to flex laterally. It's both sides that make me, I, I say it's either a misprint or, or, and you guys know I don't say this a lot, I'll admit when I don't know. They are wrong and I am right. <laughs> so please, they, it's, it's bilaterally extend the vertebral column and I could show you by like pulling on your shirts and stuff, right? Um, is, is the test going to say something different though? Um, I don't care. If the test says something different, leave me a note. I'll give you extra points because this upsets me. <laughs> I think it, because it's such a fundamental thing about the kinesiology we're learning. Like, they're just wrong. Now, the breathing thing, the forced inhalation and exhalation, is true. You have certain muscles that grab on and can help you with really heavy breathing, uh, like when you're running or something. But that's a nitpicky point compared to the extension thing. Okay, so, so just get rid of to extend it, the vertebral column in the book? Well, or push that down into the bilateral area, which oh. is what Ms. Giannis was saying. It's a correct statement, but it's bilaterally that it does that. When, if you unilaterally, that's where you get flexes. If I pull on one side of my shirt, right? But if I pull on both sides of the back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend. That's, that's just, I don't think, it can, yeah. I really think it's a misprint. I sure hope it is, for their sake. Anyway, cool. Okay, so, Mr. Kandaris, um, <laughs> and you're fuzzy. What, where are you? Okay, anyway, Mr. <laughs> um, Mr. Kandaris, so, um, what is the nickname for the quadratus umborum? What is the nickname for the quadratus lumborum? But it has a nickname. Uh, I didn't hear it. Miss Cooper, what's the nickname for the quadratus umborum? Hip hiker. Hip hiker. Yeah, it hikes up your hips. Oh, yeah, when you're walking and it lifts up. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Good. Um, and what does quadratus lumborum mean? What do the words mean? Um, four heads and attaching the iliac crest to the long bone. That was a really good guess, but. Remember, it doesn't have seps in it, and seps means head. Quadratus means four-sided. Sided, okay. Four-sided muscle in the lumbar region. Good. And if it works bilaterally, what kind of action does it create? If it works bilaterally, both sides, what kind of action is great? Extension. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And if it works unilaterally, what kind of, what kind of action does it create? Flexion. Flexion of the vertebral column or, or tilting of the hip. Yeah, cool. Thank you, sir. Okay, everybody. So that's the quadratus lumborum. That's in back. I'm turning Mr. or Mrs. Skeleton around because the rest of the abdominal muscles are basically found in front and at the sides of your body. So uh, I'm going to take a lead from the book here and actually do what they do because they're, they're really right. Um, but I want you to think about this really quickly. Your body's really smart. Have you ever wrapped up a package that you want to mail to somebody and you don't want the package to open and it's really, really important because you're sending it to somebody you really like and so you over tape it? Anybody ever done this? Right? So first what I do is we tape along the seam, right? And then we think, well, I don't want that popping open so we tape across the other way, right? And then sometimes we're like, to hell with it, I'm going to tape diagonal on this thing too. Well, your body kind of did that too. It literally was like, well, I'm going to give you a rectus abdominis to help kind of balance out your back. But then I'm going to give you some crisscross muscles going this way. I'm going to give you some crisscross muscles going the other way. And then I'm going to wrap a band around it. 
And that's literally what it's doing to give you all this strength in all these different directions. And it helps you turn and all that kind of stuff because they're diagonal, but also just sews you up really tight because you need a lot of power in this area. Yeah? Yeah. So let's talk about how it does that. We're going to come back to those. We're actually going to come back to those. Let's talk about the internal obliques. Again, take your hands like this and say internal oblique. This will be important. Your hands have to be crossed because we're looking for this angle. This is the angle of the internal obliques, right? So we're going to use yellow for, oh, actually we're not. I lied about that. We're going to use blue for internal obliques. Can somebody read me the origin of the internal obliques off the slide or off their book? It'd be the lateral and inguinal ligaments, iliac crest, and the thoracic lumbar fascia. Wow, that was good. Um, I forgot, i got to tell you guys about what the inguinal ligament is. You've all got it. Um, your inguinal ligament is essentially your swimsuit line. It goes from, can you feel the bumps on your hip here? Those bumps are these bumps on the skeleton. And you have a ligament that goes down to your pubic synthesis down here. This is your inguinal ligament. It really is this ligament that goes down like this right down here. It goes into your pubic synthesis. Yes, Ms. Petrie. Is that what makes when... Um I'm so sorry. Is that what makes people be when what happens? Uh, when, when people are, are really into working out, they, they always talk about the sexy V. Well, they're talking about the sexy V on their back. Okay, yeah, they talk about the right Oh, then that is... They call it dog Actually, Miss Petrie, you just showed us your inguinal ligament. Okay. Yeah, you're right. So that, that little area right there, if you're really lean, you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. And you can actually kind of see yours. But you're right, it's that V. I call it the swimsuit line because that's kind of where a, a swimsuit hits you kind of thing. Right? Right. Um, right. I mean, I know it depends on what kind of swimsuit and all that kind of stuff. Oh, we say, I want my, my sexy V. Yeah. Sexy it is. That. And as massage therapists, by the way, as massage therapists, it's generally the area we don't cross. Like when I get your inguinal ligament, I don't go farther in because your bladder's right here. And it just doesn't feel comfortable. But it's a ligament from what's called your as is to your pubic symphysis. Um, as is. As is stands for anterior superior iliac spine. Um, <laughs> you've got a bump on the front of your iliac crest, it's called a spine because it's off a big bump, and it's, so it's in the front, anterior, it's above another bump, superior iliac uh, spine, anterior superior iliac spine, as is. Anyway, the, the inguinal ligament goes from there down to your pubic symphysis. So, this, this, uh, this muscle likes to, to originate from there, from the lateral inguinal ligament uh, and the iliac crest and the thoracolumbar fascia in back, yep, and then it goes up and inserts where? On the internal surface of lower three ribs, rectus sheath to <laughs> linea alba. Yeah, I better talk to you about linea alba. Linea alba is essentially a ligament that runs um, from your xiphoid cy process, from your sternum, down to your pubic symphysis. Uh, you have sometimes seen it on pregnant women. It gets really dark right down their, their tummy, and that's the linea alba. It gets really dark because of hormonal changes and things like that. But it's a, it's, a, it's a ligament that kind of runs down through here. It's not exactly even a ligament, but it's a thick line of fascia that runs down there. It's called the linea alba.
yeah. Anyway, any who's. So this thing likes to come up, it's, it's deep inside here, right? And it's going to attach to the last three ribs, right? Because these two really go together. 
These two muscles like to work together, but not in ways you might think. So now take your hands, don't cross them over. This was internal obliques. See my hands there? Put your hands at your sides. This is external obliques. Yeah. So this would be my internal, this is my external. That's why I have you do that, right? So my external obliques like to attach to the fifth through twelfth ribs, which is half of your ribs over them. Well, that's a new roll of tape here. I gotta get some good tape going. And they insert down into the anterior iliac crest, mollinia alba. So they kind of come around like this. getting in my way. Okay. Which 
external and internal obliques did you use to do that? You use both your external and internal. Yes. Your left side what? External and internal. No. So here's the thing. When I turn, when you turn that way to your left. When you're saying rotate. Yes, rotate. Sorry. Yeah, very good. So this, what she's saying is, by the way, and when you thought you were doing a lateral flexion, that's why you said both on the same side, right? Yes. Brilliant. You just, you just nailed the entire thing. So don't let that confuse in your head because that's the entire thing, and that's the entire answer to the question at the end of the year. Uh, but if you can imagine this, guys, if this is my internal oblique and this is my external oblique, if they both pull, they're both trying to rotate me, but they can't, they're going to create a lateral flexion. If they both pull on the same side, they will create a lateral flexion. This one's trying to turn me this way, this one's trying to turn me this way, and they end up just pulling me over. Does that make sense at least? Your internal and your external, if they both pull on the same side, you get a lateral flexion. Do we see that? Anybody? A nod? No? Don't see it? Yes, I see it. Okay. I'm worried. I'm trying to... So, look at it this way, if I pull, pull on my shirt here and I pull on my shirt over here, on both sides it's going to pull me down. They're going to laterally flex me. If I grab on over here and I grab on over here and I pull, I'm going to pull myself down. I'm going to set this down even further. External, internal. It's hard to get my arms over here, but if they both pull, they're going to pull me down. But if the external pulls, it tends to turn me to the opposite side. If the internal pulls alone, it tends to turn me to the same side. If I grab my shirt with this hand, I pull myself that way. If I grab with this hand, I turn myself that way. So super confusing. But this is the epitome of kinesiology. If we can figure this out, you can beat any kinesiology question from here on for the rest of the year. I've got a diagonal muscle. I've got two of them, actually. Diagonal muscles can do lots of things, right? They tend to pull down and around, right? It's going diagonal, right? So let's just look at the internal, external oblique here. It goes like this. When it grabs... It wants to pull me down, but also wants to rotate me. And it actually wants to rotate me to the opposite side. My internal oblique, when it grabs, it wants to pull me down. It's going down, but it also is going that way. It wants to rotate me to the same side that's contracting. So when both sides pull, they pull me over, which is good. So when you're doing side crunches, you're working this diagonal and that diagonal. You're working an internal and external oblique on this side. When I'm doing side crunches over here, I'm working, geez, I'm working both these things over here. So are you talking about three different movements? Because one is like you're just um, bending to the side. Yep. And then one is where you're rotating yep. over, and then the other one, it almost seems like you're doing the first movement, but with a little bit of rotation. Or am I confusing all of those? Uh, no, I, I, let me put it this are way. You doing three, are you doing three different movements, I no. guess is what I'm asking, or only two? Here's the problem, and this gets really confusing, but it's really important you guys understand this. If I have a rope attached to this, and I start pulling this this direction, this ball here, is this ball going to go up, or is it going to go over? Can this, you move your camera up? Yes, sorry. I was trying to move it down for there. 
If I pull this ball from up here, is it going to go up or is it going to go over? The ball would go up, right? Well, right. And let me, let me put it this way. I'm going to pull on this. The ball is now here. Did it go up or did it go over? Well, over. Yes. And up. Yes. <laughs> when you are going diagonal, you are going up and you are going over. That's what a diagonal is. So when you have a diagonal muscle, when you have a diagonal muscle, it is, can often create both these actions depending on what other muscles are helping it. So when I have a diagonal muscle here, it wants to pull me over, but also wants to pull me down. When I have di you know what I mean? So if I'm over here, if something runs diagonal, and we use terms, we don't use terms of, of, of movement about diagonals, right? We use rotation, extension, flexion, all this kind of stuff. So if I have to describe where this thing is going in terms of up and, up and over, it's doing both. It moved up here and it moved over here. On page 194, uh -huh. I kind of uh, show some of the flexion and extension and rotation um, using the muscle. So I don't know if that's, that can help. It can help. It can. I'm also going to see, I'm going to grab, guys, take five. I'm going to grab a model from the next room and see if I can make better sense of this, too. So everybody just take a break. Goes to that same side because it's diagonally grabbing there and pulling it over. Now, it could also bend it to that side because it, it's diagonal. It's going down, too, but we're not looking at that right now. And when we look at external obliques, they're going diagonal in the opposite direction. So when they pull... They actually turn to the opposite side. Does that help at all? That's why I don't use these animations that often. No, that, they help. Oh, good. That's your internal external obliques. Now, let me see if I can find a flexion, lateral flexion of the trunk, to show you how both sides can work together. Uh, let's see. These same external obliques can pull you to the side as well because they're running diagonal. They don't do it by themselves, by the way. Other muscles have to prevent you from rotating for them to pull you to the side. But those are external obliques. See how they run diagonal forward like you're putting your hands in your pocket? That way. That's how you know which direction they're going. I'm trying to see if that internal obliques. Internal obliques. Those are external. So if somebody was having a problem. Yes, thank you. Would you have them do the action that would activate it? in order to see if that's what the problem was because it's so hard to know because there's all the layers of muscles oh yeah and oh, different yeah. ways that they work together so how yeah. would one find out exactly like and i don't mean exactly because i know you can't always know you and i know you say you cover everything because sooner or later you're going to get the part that is actually causing it right but i mean as far as us being detectives and trying to figure out what a problem is, how would we do that as far as the obliques are concerned? Right. Well, that's why I'm trying to explain this. No. If they're having a problem, if it hurts to flex this way, what two, what two obliques make me flex this way? The internal obliques? And okay. external obliques on the same side. Okay. Right? Think about it this way. Maybe this helps. 
but would it hurt to 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 flex? So would it hurt the contraction, or would it hurt when somebody would go to extend it? Because that's when it seems like it would be weaker. Or am I wrong? You're not wrong. Um. I mean, it depends on what the problem is. So when they're flexing over, is it the muscle that's hurting them or the joint that's hurting them? I, I feel like your question is excellent, but I feel like it's past where we are right now. So wait one second, because I want to make sure that we get this first part, and then we might be able to answer that. So, I really, no, no, don't be sorry. And I really meant that. It was a really good question, but I realized it, it requires a couple of layers of knowledge. So, this is the side of a body, everybody, up here on the board. I'm going to take myself off this presentation. This is the side of a body. All right? This is somebody standing here. This is their hips. I'm oversimplifying horribly here, but I want you to see something. You've got abdominals. They run this way. The blue ones, don't even worry what they're called and ones that run this way, right? If both sides pull, you're gonna pull this guy over. If we pull both sides, he can't go back, he can't go forward, he's gotta come over. If you pull me this way and you pull me this way, you're gonna end up just pulling me over. Does that make sense? But if I pull only the orange line, I'm gonna rotate him. He's going to flex a little bit too, but don't worry about that. I'm going to rotate him, and if I pull this side, I'm going to rotate him this way. Right? So let me give you another example, since this is very confusing. And I'm glad that you guys care, believe me. All right, let's take this guy. I don't want him too close. Bear with me. Okay. Okay. Let's put some abdominals on this guy. Let's see what we can do. We're getting kind of crazy, but... Okay. All right. Oh. All right. So we've got, a, we've got a human being here, right? Boom. Okay. Let's give him a very simple abdominal. And I realize he is too, too close. I'm trying to compensate for that. Let's see. But I want you to be able to see him. There he is. All right, so can we all see the man with the arm sticking out? All right. I'm leaving this kind of loose because I have to pull on it. What abdominal would this be, by the way, internal or external? Think of is that. it external? Yes, because that's how your hand would go. Remember I did this with your hand? Yeah. That's how his hand would go in his pocket. But remember we crossed our hands over to grab the guns? That would be internal. In fact, I'm going to put the internal on first because it's supposed to be on the inside. This is internal. If he crossed his hand over here, it would go this direction. Do we see how they go crisscross? Now, if I pull the external, which is contracting it, he rotates to the opposite side. If I pull the internal, which is contracting it, he rotates to the same side that I'm pulling. External, internal. If I pull them both, he will fall over into the camera. <laughs> right? That's, that's what I meant. So it's diagonal. So, so Miss Monreal was asking really good questions. She's like, I feel like you're saying two different things. Well, I am, and the confusing part is you don't ever just pull your one abdominal. So let me try to explain this. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm not frustrated with you guys. I'm trying to be a better teacher. So when I pull this, he wants to bend over a little bit. He wants to rotate, all sorts of stuff. Other muscles counteract that. Thank you, Miss Cooper. <laughs> um, Muscles don't work on their own, but when we're talking about them on their own, we just talk about all the different things they can do. So when this muscle pulls, yes, it actually causes him to want to bend forward. It causes him to want to rotate, right? And it causes him to want to come over to this side a little bit, this side a little bit. Um, and then other muscles help stop that or help that happen or whatever. But 
This muscle rotates him back this way, the internal one. This one ro rotates him to the opposite side. He's going away from the side that's contracting right now. This one, he's going towards the side he's contracting. When both sides pull, he can't rotate either way. So what does he do? He falls over. He laterally flexes, right? If you try to pull my shirt down and around frontwards, down and around backwards, I can't go front or back, so I can only go down. Both of these go down and around. So if I can't go around front and I can't go around back, I can still go down, which is flexion. Does that help? This Petri, it looks like you're, oh good, I thought your eyes were rolling back in your head. <laughs> so it is confusing. So here, since we've got this guy, let's finish this thought really quickly. So, internal obliques are in yellow. External obliques are in green. So, if I wanted to rotate this guy to his left, I would pull the internal oblique on this side and the external oblique on this side. Because look, they're both going to the same place. So when I turn, when a, when a client turns to their left, they use their left internal oblique and their right external oblique. And if you look at them, they're running the same direction. And if you look at these over here, they're running the same direction. So very strangely enough, when you do, when when Miss Hansen does her crunch to the left, she flexes her left internal oblique and her right external oblique. Where is it? Because i got to pull it. That's what would turn her. If I pull this one, she's not going to turn. I'm pulling in opposite directions. So if she wants to turn to her left, she's got to use her left internal oblique pulling and her right external oblique because they're both going to the same place. Now, I'm not, does that kind of at least visually make sense? Okay. I'm not saying you can recite it, but like, it visually makes sense. I'm glad this guy showered. Know, but yes, I do. Can you please? What, Ms. Torres? Can I please oh, what? Martha. I was just going to say, oh, I mean, um, so can, can you show us your hands again? The thing where the guns and the. <laughs> I will. Yeah. And what, what did you have to say, Ms. Okay. Monreal? So for me, I definitely get what you're explaining, and maybe I'm not explaining my question wrong, so I'd rather just show you when I go to school. Okay. If I see you, I'll ask you. Okay. Now, by the way, you, well, you're asking how do you tell which muscles give you the problem, I think, is what you're asking, right? Well, I guess what I'm asking is if you were having a client like, okay, well, flex to this side, I guess I'm saying, and I'm saying out of experience where, if I was flexing to my right, sometimes my left has hurt, but that's not the side that's flexing. So I'm just saying, how would you know? Like, wouldn't you feel the damaged area more? On I don't know. I guess I'll have to just show you. Well, by the way, some things hurt because the muscle's being activated, and that's what hurts, right? It's it's the contracting muscle. Some things hurt because they're getting stretched. That's that, what I that would be the opposite okay. side. And some things hurt because the joint hurts that the muscle is moving. Okay. Yeah. And so I was so I was wondering is could you feel the weakness on the side that's feeling stretch as opposed to the side that was being contracted? Would that be a thing that you can test for? Yeah, you probably could test for it actually, although massage therapists don't usually test for muscle weakness, but you could. You could you could no, definitely no, no, not like I mean I just meant like you looking out for that. Just never mind. I'm yeah. like I'm not explaining myself right. No, no, it's okay. It's a really complicated subject. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would look for that kind of stuff. Those kind of uh, unevenness, unevennesses in the abdominals. Okay. Yeah. I would look for one side being tight and one side being loose and things like that for sure. Okay. Imbalances in the abdominals. And by the way, that happens. So if there's, there's scoliosis, right, then once, one side of the internal and external might be pulling hard to try to pull that person back upright. And one side might be soft because it doesn't get used very much. 
That's very common. Cool. Now, luckily, by the way, the last two abdominals are super simple. So, hold on. The last two abdominals are super simple. Last two abdominals are your rectus femoris. Let me make sure we can, oh, I think we can see that pretty well. Yeah, rectus femoris. What did I not use on this guy? Your rectus femoris just runs from your cartilage of like ribs five, six, seven. Um, Mr. Yeah. Tasca? Yeah. Is it rectus femoris or rectus abdominis? <laughs> oh, Michonas, you're so, so kind. Um, it is yeah, most... I was super confused. <laughs> it's a mistake that I make with almost every class. That's why I'm laughing. There is a rectus femoris muscle. We will learn it. It is on your femur, down in your thigh. It runs up and down too, which is where it got the name rectus. But it is most definitely rectus abdominis. I appreciate not only that you corrected me, but the gentle way that you did it. Um, it is rectus abdominis. I was just testing you. Yeah, not even close. And um, the hand signals, by the way, I forgot to say, are, are external obliques, internal obliques. I remember this is internal because I've just put my hands internal, right? I've wrapped them up. So this is internal, this is external, and that gives you the angles that they're going. That's how you can tell. That's why I can be like, oh, this is my external doing this. This is my internal doing this. Both sides doing this. Yeah? Internal, external. Okay. Rectus abdominis, which is found in the abdominal region, runs essentially from my lower cartilage of my lower three, well, not lower three ribs, sorry, five, six, and seven, and your xiphoid process, down to my pubic bone. And... Um, I'm sure the book has 37 other things it can say about it, but personally, don't they have it here? Hold on. Firstly, it uh, does, it really just flexes the spine here. Now, they might say that in two different ways, because when my spine flexes here, my pelvis tilts up, right? So you could argue it tilts my pelvis, and you could argue that it flexes my spine, but they're the same thing. My spine has to bend either my pelvis coming up or my spine going down, I have to make a C. It crunches me. When you do crunches, you are working your rectus abdominis. When you do sit-ups, you're not exactly working your rectus abdominis. You are, but you're working something else much, much more. So your rectus abdominis just does this, by the way. I want you to show you how much movement it has. Watch me. That's it. That's all it does. It's a really important thing to be able to do. <laughs> it moves my pelvis. If I'm doing my pelvis down here, it just moves my pelvis that much. In this little obscene gesture I'm doing here. That's it. This very small movement. But that is so important for lower back curves and pelvic alignment. When you do a sit-up, you actually use your iliopsoas. And we'll get to that later. But this thing helps maintain back curvature. Now, do the internal and external obliques also help with this, this flexion in front? Yes, they do. They're both pulling in directions that they can help with that, believe it or not. Um, so all those muscles help in a crunch. But if you get rotating, you get your external and internal obliques better. And if you just crunch, you focus more on your rectus abdominis, but they all work. That's really how you move somebody around, right? A whole bunch of different muscles are pulling on them to get different kinds of, of movements. It's never a single muscle. Right? So if my, if my external obliques are, are pulling on both sides and my rectus abdominis are pulling on both sides, I flex. If my rectus abdominis is pulling and my external obliques on one side are pulling, I rotate and flex. If, you know, it just depends on all the combinations you use of muscles. But anyway, your external, your rectus abdominis, rectus abdominis is right here. This is the washboard muscle of your stomach. This is where the six pack comes. Or the eight pack. Or the keg, in my case. That's where it comes from. Cool? So, 
what's the last thing that I could do to make all of these muscles stronger? By golly, this area is so important. I need it to be so powerful. This is my Christmas package. I've got something running up and down. I've got stuff running diagonal. What's the last thing I could do? What do you mean, like an exercise? Uh, no, sorry. What's the last muscle I could add that would make them all oh. stronger? What do people do in the stores when they are in the gyms and stuff like that when they're lifting heavy weights? What do they do to help support their lower back? Oh, those belts. The, um, you know, the black belts, like grocery store yeah. people. That's know? exactly what I was thinking. And, and oh. what, what does, uh, no, you're, you're dead on right. Okay. Uh, yeah, the grocery store belts, the powerlifting belts, all that stuff. And which, which plane does a belt run through? Sagittal? No, transverse. Transverse plane, the transverse abdominis. What if I put a belt around all these? What if I literally put a belt? stabilizes everything. They'll tell you something in your book like it compresses the abdominal compartment, and it does. But it very much like a powerlifting belt squeezes down on all those other muscles, and when those muscles are tight and it squeezes down on them, it makes your abs really strong. Next that time makes you... sense. What? That makes sense, because when I read compress in the book, I was all confused. I was like, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. And you just like... That's why you have a teacher, right? Because some of that stuff doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. So next time you're lifting up something really heavy, watch what you do with your abdominal compartment. You don't think about this, but usually you breathe air in, you push that air out, and you clench your abdominals in. So what you've done is you've filled up your stomach and stuff with pressure inside, and you've locked down your transverse abdominus on the outside. Now you're ready to pick up something really heavy. Even just pretend right now to pick up something really heavy. Ugh, you'll feel yourself do this thing where you're pushing air out and you're squeezing your abdominals down here. That is how your body locks your upper body to your lower body when it needs to. And later when I don't need to, I can let all that stuff go, which is super helpful. So the transverse abdominus does compress the abdominal contents, but in doing so, it makes all the other muscles stronger. It locks them in. It acts like the power lifting belt for your body. And literally, that's kind of like an all hollow air tube there. And you push air out, and it pulls it in, and you make that tube solid. It creates pressure in the abdominal cavity that makes you solid. And it's a very impressive feat. Because people can literally squat 1,000 pounds on, on there, and that, that whole area is soft. And somehow they are able to create enough internal pressure there to keep it solid. It's amazing. And that's what the transverse abdominus does. Do you have a question, Ms. Monreal? No, I meant to turn my mic off. Sorry. No, don't be. I just kind of watched for him to flicker on, and I saw that, and I thought maybe you had one. Okay. I'm glad we're not doing any other muscles today because that's a lot. Yeah. All right, so let me just do... Have a what? Question, though. Please. So is that around the, the entire abdominal muscle, like in the inside, in the outside? And how thick it is it? How thick is it? It's not very thick. It's pretty thin, but you got to remember how strong muscles are. And here's the really confusing thing about talking about abdominals. Your book will give you origins and insertions, but really, on your front of your belly, well, let me back up for a second here. Do you remember what an aponeurosis is? Aponeurosis. 
Um, yes and no. Okay. The large shades of uh, fascia. Yep. So I've got three of them on my body that are really prominent. I've got what's called an abdominal aponeurosis, and it's big, and it's kind of a white section you see of abdominals in these pictures. Uh, in, the, in that movie we were watching, that's all abdominal aponeurosis. I've got a thoracolumbar aponeurosis back here. It's big too. And basically, all the abdominal muscles weave in and out of these things. So when you say it's the transverse abdominus, I mean, many people would say it lies deep to all those. But they're all woven through the abdominal aponeuroses and the thoracolumbar aponeuroses. And so they really do essentially wrap around your body. I admit the transverse might disappear here and turn into thoracolumbar aponeuroses and go into my spine and then turn back in. But it's all this belt of fascia and, and, and uh, transverse abdominus. Your, okay, it makes sense. Good. Your internal, external, your internal obliques, external obliques, rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, and quadratus lumborum are all woven into just a boatload of fascia here. And if you kind of rub your stomach, it's it's not like your bicep. It's it's a very fascia like like muscle. There's a lot of gristle in it. You wouldn't want to eat a rectus abdominis or a transverse abdominis. They're woven into just a tremendous amount of fascia. And so for convenient reasons, they go, oh, well, this thing inserts in the linea alba, but that's baloney. It inserts into all this fascia here. It's all tied together like this. So does it also, like, kind of serve as, a, like, a casing for, like, all your organs? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's keeping all your organs safe, and it, it acts as a casing for them, sure. Sure. So, like, when somebody gets a hernia, and I think, like, they can have the intestines poke through. Yeah. Because that's basically all that's really holding those inside. Is that correct? Well, uh, or, no. well, you've got other fascia that's holding those inside, but you are absolutely right that the hernia is created by internal pressure poking through the abdominal walls. Okay, so yep. is there another layer of fascia then under the muscles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, superficial fascia underneath the muscles and then all sorts of other stuff. But you're right, a hernia is really when it busts through that fascia. Really is part of your intestines usually busting out of your fascia. It's not pleasant. And that is because there's that much internal pressure. And usually people do it when? When they're lifting something. Because you want to purposely create internal pressure to blow this thing out and then lock your, your transverse abdominus, your other abdominals down on it to make it rigid. If I'm just squeezing in or I'm just blowing out, it's not rigid. Right? But if I'm squeezing in and pushing out at the same time, it becomes very rigid. So, um, is that something that somebody could do like one time? And then they created a tear, or is that something that would have had to have been weak anyway? And then that one time they just lifted something super heavy, but the damage was already there. Uh, that's what I would guess. I'm not really qualified to answer that, but I would guess it's not from a one-time thing. I, I, I would guess for lots of reasons that there was weakness there already, and then they overexerted themselves, lifted out of their okay. their norm, and yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it could be a one-time thing in the sense that somebody just went way above and beyond what they should be doing with their body, if that makes sense. But but most body injuries are actually, you know, not, I mean, obviously you break an arm here and there and things like that, but most body injuries, they were already prevalent, they were already present there before, and then you've just finally broke through. You finally took it too far. Yeah. And hernias are very common with men. I think that actually might be more because we go to lift stuff we shouldn't be lifting. Things like that. Cool.